Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of The Lash Tribe Show. My name is Julia Mann and I'm the owner and founder of Lash Tribe. We help create successful and fully booked lash artists all over the world with the help of our online and in-person training programs. And in today's episode, we are talking to the fabulous Alexandra Jane Hankin, owner of Battle Lashes. Alex was able to build this amazing training academy slash salon with staff in just a short amount of time and was really powering throughout COVID, keeping everything afloat, which not many business owners can say they have done it. And without any government support, without anything else, she has opened up the salon again and she is already in the green light very, very well ahead of everybody else in the game. So if you want to find out a little bit more on how she could achieve that, why she does not go on social media much anymore to check out all the other Lash forums, then stay tuned and I will see you within the episode. You can't be educating people if you're just educating them off the one thing that you've been taught and then you've put that into practice for two years. The first question is we ask them, sure, no problems, what type of lashes do you have on? And like the response that comes back is that just... <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today, Alex. I'm really excited. <laughs> Me too. I am really excited. It's been a while since we've seen each other. It has been a while. So we've met each other quite a few years ago now, but I've already kind of introduced you to the, the crowd beforehand. But just in your words, just explain to everyone real quickly who you are, where you are from and what you do. Yeah, sure. My name is Alex. Um, I've got a, a beauty salon. Uh, we mainly focus in eyelashes. I'm in Canberra, ACT. Um, but, you know, we don't... I think if COVID taught me one thing, it's not to put all my eggs in one basket. So there's quite a lot of stuff in the pipeworks at the moment um, and they're all in completely different industries. So I don't really know who or what I am just yet post COVID, but we're going to figure it out. <laughs> I think anyone quite knows what the hell is going on. <laughs> we just got to go with the flow, right? Yeah, that's it. That's it. How did you start in Lashes and how did you open up your salon? What was the kind of main factor for you to do this and have you been always doing beauty yeah so um 12 years in beauty now um and i was that girl at school you know who just never had any eyelashes i just knew how it made me feel i would do anything to you know either wear 10 hundred coats of mascara or i would wear strip lashes or you know the individual um uh, semi-permanent clusters whatever it was so that was always since i was i don't know 14, 15, like that was just my thing. Um, accidentally started the business in Lashes uh, five years ago and obviously blinked and here we are. But it's just something that I know how good it makes me feel as a woman. And when I start, you know, I asked, you know, my friends, they were like, oh, can you do my lashes? I started doing theirs and then their friends started asking. So that was when things got a little bit serious. So had to do the right thing, of course, and, you know, look up what it took to actually run or own a business. What were the legal requirements and all that kind of stuff? And to be honest, there wasn't a lot of information. <laughs> On any website, on government websites, you know, basically it was get an ABN and pay your taxes if you have to. And it was like, Bob's your uncle, do whatever you like. So, you know, over the year, five years now, um, it's been a lot. There's no one tells you how to run a business. And unless you have good grounding morals and you have a good work ethic, then, you know, hopefully you can build a sustainable business but if you don't that's where we kind of get all the cowboys in all the different industries whether it be you know accounting or um you know or beauty and hair and whatever it doesn't matter every single industry there's there's people who just don't really care about what it is that they're doing so you know when there's no information out there it's really up to the small business people to do the right thing so you know out by ourselves yeah that's right i was gonna ask now when you first started five years ago with lashing was it like a natural process for you to then open up your own salon slash 
training academy, which you have now as well, did you have any help along the way? How did you manage that? Because I know you're also a mother. Tell me a little bit about that. It's a lot to juggle. Yeah, of course. But, um, you know, I've got my little boy my own and I always have. So no different to me at all. And I always just wanted the best for us. You know, everything just happened organically. It was that I was just so, I loved, I still do love what I do so much. And, you know, always wanting to find out more or always researching more or testing and trying different things led to more people wanting to be involved, which led to growing a team, which then led to people being like, hey, you're really good at this. You're the best in your area. Can you teach me? And that was coming from other salon owners. So, you know, all of this stuff happened organically. Um, I've definitely been one to hold back the reins quite a bit because I want things to be perfect. And I know how much stuff is, you know, on the internet, even more so now that it's just, it's shit. <laughs> like, we'll be honest, like, it's bloody awful. And, you know, I think could obviously be a lot bigger and better, you know, if I did just kind of not care as much, but then, you know, where's the quality and where's the service providing when it comes to that kind of stuff. So everything that has happened, I've never forced it. It's always happened organically. Um, it's always just more pressure on top of more pressure on top of more pressure. Like you said, you know, you know, I've got a two year old on my own next minute, you know, I'm home from the army. I've got this business and I've got a team and then we're moving into a commercial space and then we've got, you know, these other salons wanting to come and train from us and it's just, and then we got shut down during COVID. So I just like... How did that change what you are currently doing? Because I know you're back at training others and doing the treatments and everything. Like, did you have to let anyone go or how did it all work out for you over there? We were extremely lucky. We had just taken over um, a second commercial premises. So we were moving from one place to the next. So paying for two places during the shutdown, which no one obviously, we could never foresee what was about to happen in 2020 for us. We were affected by the bushfires. We got evacuations and shut down from that. Um, our new premises got smashed by a hailstorm in February. So every it was flooded all the flooring had to be replaced everything and and then in March we got shut down so I mean if you could talk about every single type of element from mother nature that could come and wipe us out it happened but you know coming back I think the whole entire world has changed we can't just think that we can go back to just doing services and stuff like that like we used to because, A, people are out of their habits. They're used to not having lashes on. You know, they potentially have lost their jobs. You know, what we do is a luxury service and the first thing that's going to be let go out of anyone's budget is a luxury item. And, and I understand that because, you know, like for me it was the same. It was like, okay, well, I can't have my things either because yeah. I've got things to protect. For so me, I got rid of nails, but I needed to put lashes on somehow. <laughs> So I put, I have to have lashes, otherwise, oh my God. Did yeah. you find that um, most people had to let go of one thing or another, but actually they came back straight away once you opened up again, or were you getting a little bit more quiet? Uh, no, we had, you know, after the five years of doing what I've done, you know, I've got an extremely loyal client base. So if it wasn't for my client, you know, every now and then we had, you know, a random, you know, something pop into our account and it was just like, because we love you guys. And one of our clients would just oh, wow. have an appointment that they would have had at that time, you know, not everyone. And it was, you know, just a once off every now and then, but whatever they could do to support us, they were. And, you know, we're really grateful for that. If if it wasn't for having that really good customer service bond and relationship that we have with our clients, like I would have lost my whole entire team. Um, you know, we would have lost all of our clients and we would have lost a business. Let's go more in detail about that, specifically that, because you say you have such a loyal client base and you build all that in a very short amount of time. And I know that a lot of salon owners either had to shut down completely or they may be 50% less busy now. What do you think you did differently up until COVID hit that made you such a standout salon? Because I know you guys are not cheap either. Your training is very nicely priced, just like myself. Why, why do you think so many people having issues? So I think what people are missing out on is that 
you know, it's not a privilege to have your clients, you know, it, it needs to be seen the other way around, you know, you need to be privileged in, in the fact that, you know, they, they want to come to you. And I think in the mark in Canberra specifically, because when I travel outside of Canberra, I see it totally different. We have this mentality where, um, you know, people should, you know, feel lucky to come to us. That's not customer service. That's not providing a service. And that's not what the service industry is about. You are there to provide a certain service that you are, you know, rendering in in retrospect, moving forward and, and collecting money for a service that you have said that you're going to produce. And I think people forget that all the time, that they build this big brand. You know, they build this culture around this brand that they're just like, oh, but everyone, you know, wants to come to us and we've got this ridiculous waiting list. And it's like, but if you're not actually giving your clients what they're paying for, then they're not coming back. And it's a service-based industry. You listen to your clients. You know, if something isn't working for them, what can you actually do to fix that problem? You know, you're servicing someone's problem. It's what we do. We're problem fixers. So, you know, if someone has an issue, it should be, yep, no problems. I, you know, let's move forward and let's make this the plan for you now. You know, is there something you want to change? And keeping on top of that every single time a client comes back, because a lot can happen in three or four weeks. So much can happen in three or four weeks between when we get to see clients coming back. So if we're not proactive in being like, what, you know, how was your service last time? Did you want to make any changes? What can we do for you? If we just shut them in the chair, did whatever we liked, then they, we would never know if they're actually happy or not. We follow up with new clients all the time. You know, we just, we're going to keep all of your feedback confidential because, you know, I mean, I, we have built our business off word of mouth. So I don't need to be going and posting testimonials online all the time because we gain most of our clients through word of mouth. Um, but we actually ask for that feedback. Every couple of months, our, um, our regular clients will get a message asking about a service that they received. But two days after every single new client has been, they'll receive a message and it'll be like, we just want to know, um, you know, how your service was. All of your um, feedback is going to be kept confidential. But we actually need this to know how to service you better. And I think a lot of people forget that, you know. They don't do it at all. Yeah, they just do the service and they don't realise that marketing is more expensive trying to get new people into the door. And just service the ones you have. Yeah. They like you already. They want to keep coming to you. So don't give them a reason not to. Give them a reason to spend more money, you know, and, and invest in you more. The more you can get your clients to invest in you, then the more you can return that favour and invest in them. Better products, better training, you know. With the training, what do you think are some things that you have done better than others? Or differently perhaps um in the beginning um there was a lot of you should because we said kind of in the industry so it was you know and we still see this a lot um you know where we're in a somewhat unregulated industry we know that there are some requirements but basically you know it is about everyone self-regulating yeah. but there is so much of this I don't care who you are, you shouldn't be doing this, blah, 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 going on, especially when it comes to training or applying lashes. But if you can't practice what you preach, then you can't be preaching that other people are doing things wrong. And this is what I don't like because... There's propaganda too. How much has the industry changed in five years? So when much. I started doing lashes, there was no such thing as Russian volume in Australia. No one knew anything about it. You know, this fanning volume technique that we use now, like there are 10 hundred different ways that you can do it with 400 different types of tweezers. You can't be, you know, putting other people down and, you know, naming shaming people with the way that you're, um, you know, other people are training to gain, you know, your own students or those kinds of things. But if you can't practice what you preach and you don't actually have any, like, in-depth experience then you can't say it's neither here or there and I think with what we teach it's I've done this I have run this model for five years and we are a ridiculously profitable company you put another company in front of me that looks like ours and show me the figures and tell me our model doesn't work this is what we teach we teach something that actually works for our clients, because we've been able to retain them for five years, 
It's good for the industry because our name is known within the industry. It's good for people coming to learn because it's a proven model. Yeah. You know, there's just so much. And I think, you know, it, you just have to learn to put some blinders on, I think, when you get to a certain point. Cause yeah. And we can get really in depth here. And this is something that really grinds my gears too. It's because one person who might have a name in the industry has an opinion about a thing. It doesn't make it a proven statistic for everybody else. Right. But everyone seems to just jump onto this one bandwagon. They hear one person says this and everyone goes, yep, yep, yep. Totally right. And then they pretend like they were the inventor of that, even though one person said one thing, but it might be not even true or applicable to a certain amount of clientele. Right. It has to do with styling, the name of the stylings. I see so many people say, no, that's not the right word. I'm like, excuse me, like I have my own training company. I make my own names up. I don't care what other people use. Um, yeah, it, it really is something that I, I guess we could talk about all day long. What do you think of people who are literally just finishing off their training themselves, learning lashes, um, maybe not even volume, but just done classic lashes for two years or something like that, and now they want to train? Who did you go and train from in the beginning? Yeah. Where are you getting your information from? And where's the proof? Because I think you can't be educating people if you're just educating them off the one thing that you've been taught and then you've put that into practice for two years and then you're then going to go and educate in that. I'm not saying go and do 10 hundred other training off other people and try and rip off their stuff that's not what this is about. It's, are you sitting up every single night researching what products are made of, where people, you know, are getting these products from, what, you know, what are the ingredients in them? How are they manufactured? You know, like, are you actually looking into what it is that you are selling? Yeah. Or are you just selling a process? Because, I mean, if we were selling a process with lashes, we could put it into five steps. A proven business model that we know is, you know, going to be keeping our industry alive potentially and hopefully for many years to come. Where do you think the industry is going now? I think people are slowly going back to that. Doesn't matter what it is, what it looks like or where it comes from. It just needs to be cheap and quick. I feel that at the moment, but we've been like, we've done this probably, you know, once a year, I think it happens. So everyone's like, you know, I don't want to be paying too much for this. That's too much, blah, blah, blah. I'll just get whatever. And then you see it drop and then everyone's just like, no, you, you know, I'm only going to go and get quality now, you know, and then we get those people on the quality train. And then you see a spike of people. And then again, being like, I don't care. I just want in. It doesn't matter where I'm getting it done. I don't really care. And it's funny that you said this because we a couple of weeks ago, we did an Insta Live on what are the different types of lashes that you could have put on. And if we ask someone who comes to us to get, you know, an infill or a rebalance from another salon, the first question is we ask them, sure, no problems, what type of lashes do you have on? And, like, the response that comes back is that... <laughs> just, <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I think I have 13s. And, like, we know that that means a length. Like, that means shit to us. <laughs> And it's like, okay, but like, that's fine. But you might not actually be able to have that. Let's just, <laughs> uh, do you know if they're volume or like, are they classic, you know? So, and then we get, you know, are these the people who aren't educating their clients or the consumer on what they're paying for? Are these the people then going and training other people in the industry? Do you know what I mean? So it's just this, at the moment, I think it's a huge shit, but to be honest, um, I think it's only because we're so consumed because we're in our industry where I'm sure it happens in every single industry. I, I don't think know. that the lash industry specifically can be quite a, a toxic environment. I don't find that in hair forums, for example. I'm also a hairdresser by trade. I'm not that active in them, but it doesn't seem to be as cutthroat and as bitchy in those forums. I don't know what it is about lashes. What do you think about people telling other people what they should be charging? Like, you know what I mean? Like that people say in our area, you must be at least charging $120 for a classic set. 
and then others charge $50. Like how, how do you think that goes down for our industry? I think if you haven't gone and sought training from somebody reputable, and I know it's hard for uneducated people to know who's reputable, but, um, you know, if you haven't, then you shouldn't be doing eyelash extensions as far as I'm concerned. If you have done, you know, you can tell if someone's reputable, I suppose, by their social media presence and, and, and what it is, you know, you can see all of that kind of stuff. They're professional in what it is that they do. They will normally set you a target in regards to what you are worth. And I think there's a big difference between industry averages and what you're worth. That is very true, but also actually knowing your break even point, because a lot of people have no idea how much it costs them. They think they're just using the products and that's it, but there's so much more to it. If there are an actual business such as rent, staff, electricity, social media, marketing, uh, insurance, phone, website, Everyone's like, what do you mean insurance? I'm like, you're selling a service to someone. Like, you need some kind of business business insurance. Like, like at a minimum, you know, like public liability. If something happens to that person, do you know what I mean? You have a duty of care. And I think, you know, I 100 solely percent agree with you on this one. Is that, you know, businesses or uh, companies like mine will often get shunned on our price point. But the thing is like we have the best products. Our staff are, you know, trained to a T. You can go to any of them and receive the exact same service. You know, we have a five year proven business model, you know, of expertise of, um, you know, educated technicians. We have, there's just, and we will get, you know, put down by other businesses or people who are just starting out being like, it's too expensive. I'm like, okay, no worries. So we can get rid of, um, you know, our good quality. We can just use some super glue, you know, like, and like, do you like, you know, like my girls love your adhesive. So now I've got one staff member in particular, she won't use anything else, but your clear. Um, and the other girls kind of swap and change. And we've got a few others that they don't really, really mind. Um, but they've got their favorites, you know, but they know what quality is. If I put, you know, like something in front of my girls, it does not take them longer than 20 minutes to tell me whether if that's a quality piece of product or not. Yeah. But, you know, going back to what you said about other businesses are shaming you for being too expensive, you would never hear that from someone who's more successful than you. You will only ever hear that from people that are not as successful as you are. So it doesn't really matter what they say, does it? (laughs) They will be doing trying to put too many people in to get them in faster to to make more money because they're spending too much money because they're not actually covering any of their costs. And so they don't last very long. And then, you know, they'll end up coming across and they're like, I just don't know how you did it. Like that's the general response I get from people who have done lash businesses at home. And they're like, you know, it's just not worth the money. And I'm like, (laughs) from home, especially it's worth the money. I mean, you don't have any of the overheads. (laughs) Like, were you running a business or was it a hobby? You know, were you paying other people to do their lashes or were people paying you to do their lashes? There's a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually really interested to know where the name Battle Lashes comes from. I have told this story probably 80 times in the last two days and there's a persistent... Not to me. (laughs) That's funny because it's just, you know, you know how, like, everything happens for a reason. Their doors get shut in your face because other ones are meant to open. So um, we're looking for another commercial space. So this will be our, (laughs) I'm going to say maybe seventh location in five years. Wow. It is something that people don't talk to you about as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you're not just running a business, you're trying to figure out how to do commercial real estate and, you know, you know, it's not about eyelashes and what, who's doing the manufacturing. It's like all this other stuff as well. But so, um, I got home from the army, um, and I had an injury. So I was off for 12 months and I was fine with that because I had a two year old at home. 
Um, I came home, my parents had him and my girlfriends were like, great, now that you're home, can you do my lashes? And I've got a friend that wants hers done too. And I was like, look, I want to do this the right way. Let me just get everything set up. I'll get a bank account so that she feels more, you know, safe giving me money for a service. Um, and that, I've always been like that. I just, I want to do the right thing. You know, there's no, I don't half ask stuff. It's just, I'm always there just to do the right thing. And did all, it took me about three days. And um, I just, every single name I thought of was taken. And I was like, you know what? I've done everything. I've researched. I've been awake for 70 plus, 72 plus hours, just getting ABNs, learning about what an ABN means. Like, what are my tax? I did all that stuff. And I just couldn't, like, you need a business name. If you're going to have a business, you need a name. Anyway, I couldn't think of anything. And so I was like, I guess it's just not meant to be after three days. I was like, ready to throw in the towel. <laughs> And, um, and I had a name, stuff it. I know. I've got an ABN and all the things, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and I went to sleep that night and um, I hadn't had a dream at all since I'd had my son. And it was the only dream I had. And I saw this building that was like, it was kind of like a really big building, like a couple of stories. It was red brick. It had like a high gloss black trim around these incredible massive windows. And on there in high gloss black in the current font we have was battle lashes. That. So I woke, you know, as soon as I woke up, I checked it, it was available and I was like, that's it. And for the past I've had this building in my head and I'm like, it needs to, what am I looking for? Where is this coming into place? And um, we've got the 12 months lease where we are and I was considering um, renewing it where we currently are now, but um, a building on the corner of the next street just took all of its scaffolding down and it is exactly the building that I saw in my dream five years ago. Mm. And I just, and I'm like, yeah. So somehow we need to figure out how to get battle lashes in that space, but that is, yeah, the next thing that's moving forward. That's amazing because that's kind of how I found my space. It was what I envisioned all along and I was looking very hard and I couldn't find anything and then this one was literally just by chance. I walked past it, people moved out and I said, hey, what are you doing? Oh, we're just moving next door to the space next door, which I was supposed to look at with my real estate agent. And then I said, no, I'm supposed to look at this space you're just moving into. No, no, we've already taken it. And like, but how can my real estate agent said it's available? So with two real estate agents at play, they didn't communicate. Anyway, long story short, and I said, okay, well, I really wanted to be in this area, in this beautiful area in Bulimba in Brisbane. Too expensive, can't afford it. And they said, well, we need someone to take over our lease. So I went into the space and it was available. It wasn't on the market yet. And they gave it to me for a better price and they were going to put it up because I took over the lease and that's how I found my space. It was crazy. <laughs> Things are just meant to be sometimes, right? And you just got to go with that. And, and I think that if you really want to go into your space, you'll get into it. Yeah, I agree. I was lucky enough to keep all of my staff during COVID. So, you know, like I'm able to retain, you know, if there's one tip I can give anyone, it'll be that if you are running a small business, you know, in the beginning, it's hard, but you need to kind of chip away and you need to at least have, you know, maybe two to three months of expenses up your sleeve. You know, that needs to be sitting yep. in the bank and it needs to, you'll see it go down and it'll go up and it'll go down and it'll go up. If we didn't have that, I so heartedly believe that we would not have made it out of COVID. Mm. We didn't get any leniencies when anything. And whatever my accountants did at the time made us ineligible for any of the things. So we, I kept my staff employed the whole entire time during shutdown. We paid every single person, all of our, you know, everything that we have, suppliers, rent, we could, didn't get any leniency there, nothing. So if we didn't have that, you know, we would have either gone into debt and who knows if we could have paid it back. Like there's just so many things that could have happened. And I think, you know, trying to work smarter and not harder 
putting that little kitty away really saved us. The day we got to open, we had minus $500 in the bank account. And I was like, let's do this. Let's start it all over again. So you know, that's amazing. Yeah. And you have to, if it's, if you love it and you've got that passion there, then you've just got to go for it. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it goes to show that, it doesn't matter if you have a multi-million or billion dollar company. If you don't have those savings, you are stuffed because those people, they are just literally breaking even every single day to keep the business afloat, but they're not actually making any money that they can put away for savings. So it's all about the profits you're making and things that you're putting away. That's a really, really great tip as well. I also think now, like, you know, with I think about how we get out of this COVID in regards to, you know, like our economy and stuff like that. and mm -hmm. We know that it is small business that pays all the taxes. So, you know, the ones that are going to be paying back these huge debts, it's, it's people like us. And we need more small businesses. And so if anyone has a small business idea, I think, you know, they need to try and do whatever they possibly can at the moment to put that into play and see how it goes. And, you know, like people need jobs. We need more small businesses to open to create, you know, to be able to provide more jobs because as soon as that happens, like this is the only way that our economy is going to get out of the debt that they're in because of people like us, because of the people that they shut down, you know? So it is a little bit bittersweet when, you know, it's just, you know, but I so hard to believe that, you know, it is going to be people like us that put, you know, all of that money back into the economy so that it does make Australia stronger again. So yeah, more small businesses. I'm all for it. Any ideas, make it happen. Do whatever you can. If they want to start a lash business, I mean, you maybe you can tell them a little bit about how they can reach you. Obviously, battlelashes.com.au. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, battlelashes.com. Um, we've got, um, you know, we definitely innovated during that time. We don't believe in just um leaving people to kind of do their training on their own um we're really hands-on just like the last tribe is we um we've got our online components but there are face-to-face -face, um or zoom over online components that you actually do need to complete um and we've got 12 months of mentoring attached to every single one of our training courses so you know we normally get students come back maybe once or twice or three times after they do their training and then they feel comfortable enough to start doing um, clients at home you know yeah. you cannot learn how to do lashes in a day um you know like we've got day up courses we do that we train people how to do lashes in a day but attached to that is 12 months of mentoring because you can't learn everything you need to do in a day like oh. you just absolutely can't no like, Right. But you also teach the uh, business component as well in your training courses, right? Because that's so, so, so important because you can't just throw someone out and say, there you go, you know how to do lashes. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do. I think, and that's my favourite part of it now. Um, you know, I, I just love talking about business and I didn't realize how excited it made me like literally last night I was up until 4 a.m because I just came up with another business idea and I was like this is probably like my favorite out of all you know and I've got two others in the pipeline at the moment you know one of them is a huge outlay because it actually needs quite a large commercial space um the other one um is you know, I've set it all up and now other people need to push the go button. Um, but this other one is moving into like e-commerce because I've got no idea about that kind of stuff and it's huge right now. So, yeah, you know, just researching. There is so much stuff like this is so valuable. The amount of podcasts that I listen to, like whether if they're like, you know, inspirational people, if they're people in the industry that I'm in, if they're people who are just in any type of area that it is that i need to learn something about you know i'll spend the time and i will feed through things until i'm finding little nuggets that you know it gives me that aha like moment where it's like i now know how to put this into play so you know there's a very big difference between people who just you know want to go to work and be employees and people who want to be business owners you know there's a huge difference so yeah digging you know and keep finding out stuff and keep moving forward then you're definitely kind of more business orientated where if you're more than happy just to you know go and do your so you can learn how to do lashes but if you don't want to learn about 
the business side of things, then go and work for someone else. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I worked for someone else. I mean, it's so much weight on our shoulders, isn't it? At all times. So this is what we're doing. Like, oh my God, I've got this incredible idea. And they're just like, okay, Alex, like we're happy to support you. But remember, we just want to, we're good here. You know, like we've got this. They're like, you go do you and we've got this. And I'm like, okay, are you sure? Does anyone want to come? Because like, this is really fun, you know, like, so I'm just like, you know, I've got the best team. They're like my family um, and they all have their different, you know, perks about them. So I'm lucky that, you know, they are, they love their, you know, it's not a nine to five. They, they all work really hard and they love their jobs and what it is that they do. But giving them flexibility and growth within their positions is probably the best thing I've been able to do for them. Um, and we did all of that during COVID. Yeah. That, the shop in our pajamas most days and you know tried to figure out you know how to be a school teacher to our children because we've got kids and we, you know how do we save this business and yeah. what else can we do to make money so yeah I think it's like you're going really well and I can't wait to see any of your other ideas come to fruition if anyone that's watching or listening in is interested to get in contact with you um, for any training in Canberra or even online Get in contact with Alexandra Jane Hankin at battlelashes.com. Uh, one last question that I actually got from another podcast that I listen to all the time from one of my mentors always has like a end question, which is very unprepared. But is there anything that I should have asked you that you want to talk about or something that you want to get off your chest? <laughs> no, I think we got it all off you know I think we get so stuck like you said in this industry and I think a lot of it is bullying I think a lot of it is trying to use other people um you know and there's a lot of naming and shaming and you know after five years I'm exhausted from it and I don't participate and it's not to say that you know it's not to discredit anyone's hard work or the things that they're doing but, you know, you need to just do what's right for you. And if there's one thing I learned after having my son, it would be that there's a huge difference between listening to, um, like, listening to here instead of listening to this. You know, we're taught at school to, you know, listen to here and think logically and, you know, do all those things. And that's fine to do that because I'll always make sure that I'm making the right steps because I've got a child to think about as well as a whole entire staff of team. And, but, you know, every time something happens and I know I should have done it, you know, it's like that hindsight is a wonderful thing. I just don't do it anymore. Like, I'm like, I feel like this, I'm going to say this, I'm going to explain this, I'm going to do this and that is just I think you know especially now I'm going to be 30 this year I feel like I should get another year in my 20s because of COVID but that's fine I think now like listening to this it's so life is so much easier it is totally what what anyone else thinks about you is none of your business yeah I agree you just got to concentrate about yeah what you are doing and the way that you're heading actually it's funny um just to kind of finish off this podcast something that i have found myself doing and i've always been trying to kind of like a trailblazer always trying to do things differently but i feel like at times i have come back especially in the last 12 to 18 months where I've kind of gotten a little bit complacent and I have taken on other people's opinion too much again. So what I've done, I've completely rewritten all our manuals. I have come up with completely new ideas that have to do with my thing, my training, and has nothing to do with what anyone else says. Like I said before, there's different terms for different things. So I think it's so important if you want to stand out or feel better about what you do is to make it really you, truly you, what you feel and not what anyone else is doing. It doesn't mean that I don't look at the good things people are doing, but I still try and kind of reinvent for myself, even if it's the same thing. I mean, there's only so many ways you can put on a lash, right? But the way that you teach it and the way that you describe the things and the terms that you're using and stuff like that, that is what sets you apart and creating this real system like you have with your training 
is so important rather than just training how to put on a lash, but training entire systems and structuring everything for success is so much more important. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> That's the best thing, you know, like we get to, we get to put a bit of us into those kinds of things. And as you know, I know so many times people say, you know, remove yourself from your business, remove yourself from your business, but my business would not be what it was today if it wasn't for my influence. So I have to have my touches and I have to have my presence in that shop all the time, not because I don't trust my team, but that's, you know, Banner Lashes is literally my heart and soul. Yeah, and no one will ever do it exactly the same that you want to do it. And I might change what I feel like wearing tomorrow. I might wear black instead of white and it changes my mood and I might want to change the terminology in my manuals. Like, I'm doing it right now. We found a better platform. And I'm like, this one's shit. I want this better one. And so you're like, because nothing's ever perfect, right? And I'm like, yeah, God, yeah. It will never be perfect. Don't try and chase, chase the perfect. It will never happen. Yeah, I just want the it's best. Inventing. I mean, how boring would it be if you have something that is perfect? Because you'll never, ever change anything about it again and you never evolve so we have a, um we've got a new slogan that's going up underneath our battle lashes sign um and it says that perfection does not exist but excellence does very true i love it that is a great end <laughs> to this podcast everybody remember that and thank you so much for joining me today i hope you all enjoyed listening or watching the lash tribe show and i will see you all in the next episode.